We're really excited to have uh, Professor Steve Whitaker here up from um, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Steve works at the intersection of psychology and computation, looking at how we live our everyday lives online. Uh, Professor Whitaker uses insights from cognitive and social sciences, design digital tools that support memory, collaboration, and socializing. So a lot of the future of what we are all sort of hypothesizing up here in the last uh, group. Um, and his past research has been funded by the EU, NSF, EPSRC, and Microsoft. And currently he's on a Google grant to look at online collaboration. And soon he'll be taking over as editor of the HCI Journal. Steve Whitaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, first, quite, well, I'll start with the metaphor. Well, it's actually a simile. It's like I'm the guy who comes along after the horse show, right? And this is what I feel like I'm kind of doing. So that, but that's a simile. It's just being straight. We invented the English language. So a simile is it's like something or other. A metaphor is where you don't invoke the like. But anyway, that, that pedant, pedantry aside, okay. So this, if you type email into overload into Google, you get me first, okay? So if you, any reason why you might or might not want to listen to me, I'm, I invented the term email overload. That's not to say I've solved it. I think this is great stuff. I'll show you where I first thought of the boomerang idea. But anyway, so and implemented it in notes, but anyway, so we'll do a bit of history, whatever. Okay. Okay, so as we talked about in the productivity session, this is not a new problem. And I guess we won't be looking at the right hand side of the slides, because I'm not going to fix that now. So um, I think you can find your first references to information overload in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's mentioned in Romans. Uh, obviously, uh, Erasmus was one of, a big shout out for him. So he, is there anywhere on earth exempt from these swarms of new books? But what I think we're seeing now is a very pernicious new variant because it's not about kind of passive information sitting in a library. It's about things that are manipulating or calling upon our attention. So what I want to do now, which is kind of the narrative structure, which is I want to revisit some myths about information overload, and I want to talk about the fact that it seems like it's not information that's our problem, it's a specific type of information, which is information that demands us to do something. I mean, we may not actually have to do something about it, but just the very act of deciding whether we have to do something is taking up our you know, cognitive bits. I'm going to talk about some behavioral data which speaks to the, these kinds of issues. And then I want to talk a little bit about, which overlaps with the last panel, about uh, future technologies which are based around what I would call micro self-awareness, which is similar to the rescue time approach. And I want to talk about some stuff we're doing on kind of macro self-awareness, which is like, generally, how do I spend my time? And this is in the spirit of behavior change where we're trying to get people to see high level patterns that they can possibly, first of all, be aware of and then kind of change. So, you know, two quick myth busters. So, you know, if you listen to the popular press, it seems like one big problem is we've got too much digital stuff, right? But this is, this is kind of, this is archival. Right? It's irrelevant to us. Most people don't actively manage this digital stuff, and I've done experiments where I've shown people they can't find old valued photos, and what happens is, you know, they get very, very upset, but this is a temporary problem for them. This is not the thing that's bothering them. The second thing is a kind of research fetish. So I know that some people are actually in businesses like you. Your business is new information. But for the general person in the street, their problem is not that they're a crusading journalist who's trying to find new stuff. So if you're in tech, you're in journalism, you know, you're in marketing, this is your particular issue. But for a lot of people, you know, they are not sitting, you know, in a library thinking great new thoughts, synthesizing complex information. Right? So the reason why we get this from NPR all the time is they're all journalists, right? And they've got a particular lens. This is the way that they see the world, right? And this is the way they focus on it. And that's the story we get. 
Now, what I think there's some really interesting psychology organizational work on how people use research to make real decisions. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, research is used to kind of back up decisions that people have made on gut. Right? That's not to say it's not used, but this is how it's frequently deployed. So, just to reiterate, our problem is not exploration, it's attention, right? So it's not a quest for new knowledge, right? So when people talk, they don't say, oh my god, you know, I've got such bookmark stress, right? My gosh, I wish I could do more Google stuff right now. It's really kind of, or my god, my archive, that's really bothering me. Well, so, for so, I'll talk about, if people are interested in personality and archiving, you know, we can talk about the hoarders program and how that's a bit biological. But they are saying, yes, overloaded inbox, yes, too many IMs, yes, too many texts. Right? So the real problem for people is stuff that's personal. Right? It's demanding action or not from me. Right? And if you have to make that decision, that's a problem. Things I may, maybe, right, and that's a problem, have to do something about. It's not stuff I have to read. And again, I apologize for the information people Right? But, you know, for most people, it's not, do I have to make sense of this? It's, do I actually have to do something about it? And we're getting a similar dynamic that's built up, you know, so I see a lot of teenagers, I talk to them, there's a social imperative about doing stuff around social obligations, especially when you've started posting stuff on Facebook, it's kind of what reception is it getting? So you see the same, similar kind of attentional and social draw into that, where people are kind of uh, committed into the application. Okay, so the two big problems with, uh, these are, by the way, this is, this is uh, uh, vampires and zombies, and you can kind of see the analogy there. Um, so first of all, you know, we have a diversion from things we should be doing. All right, so one of the things that email does and these kind of attention-grabbing applications is they pull you away from stuff that you feel like you should be doing. And the second thing is, once you're in there, you can kind of spin around and you can spend all day doing stuff in email. Because email begets email, which is the kind of zombies metaphor. Okay, so breaking news from 1996. Let me just read this, right? This is something speaking in 1996 about email, right? I check it before I leave, I, before I leave the house. Just in case there's anything I didn't get to the night before. This is without net, you know, this is before smartphones or whatever. And I read it as soon as I get into the office. It does change what I do. It, it changes my thinking. You know, I maybe, maybe I'm going in thinking I want to do one thing like budget, and it sort of diverts me into something else. So this is just, just not you, all right? So the statistics on behavior show that people check email 19 times a day. There's some studies in certain organizational contexts, and it does depend on organizational culture, but in some places, they have, they're told to actually put their alerts on. 70% of messages are attended to within six seconds. I would not like to work in that organization. Then there's these kind of uh, capture traps, tra traps, which are, we've all got really valuable information in emails, so you kind of get into this cycle like, Oh, you know, that reference document, that attachment's in email, I better go and get it. Whoops, oh, I just saw a message I should reply to. Oh, there's another one, right? And so on, and then we're off. Where did that time go? This is just completely familiar to us. Then the other one is if you're using a browser client, you go in there, you're trying to look up some information, you're searching. Oh, I've just seen, you know, my, I've got an extra email because it's in the browser. I'll go and look in there. And we've already talked about this. There's the cost of resuming the task, which I've seen estimates for software engineering can be 40 minutes for complex programming. I've seen, also seen the statistic of, of, of one minute. One of the interesting things about this is it's, it's not just the cost of resuming the task. On some occasions, people forget to go back to that task. So there's some very interesting behavioral work on interruptions in organizations. 40% of the time, people never go back within that day anyway. And then there's these very interesting statistics about email stress, which is that the people who are least stressed about email are the people who spend most time in it. But the question is, are they productive? I mean, they could be managers and that could be their job, but... Okay, more breaking news from 1996. There's the paper, right? It's got the boomerang idea and I'll show you that. Right? 
People have huge inboxes. My God, 2,482 inboxes average in this company I looked at. Right? You know, oh, task management. Important messages can't be discharged at once. People keep 49% of messages in their inbox as reminders because we're trying to manipulate our attention. We're all just completely familiar with this. So the email, uh, the email inbox is doing double duty. Right? It's our place that we go to to look for new stuff, but it's messed up by the fact that we're trying to use it as a reminder place. And I, I completely agree with this, getting the reminders out. Okay, so first stand, so we talk, we've talked about um, is technology the solution? Let's talk about a little bit of social engineering first. So there's some very interesting research experiments now being done about email vacations. So I don't know which organizations volunteer for this, but it's kind of interesting. So uh, some people from University of Irvine have done this kind of stuff where they've had certain individuals who are actually in the research part of, organi of the organization, which may be telling, they're, they're shut off, no email for a week. What you see is totally unsurprising, increased focus, increased planning, that's to say they're kind of doing this kind of what should I be doing today, meta work, decreased heart rate, so this is consistent, actually, you know, speaking as an ex-psychologist, it's not an addiction pattern, it's, it's uh, intermittent reinforcement which is doing it for them. I can explain that difference afterwards. But anyway, so then they've produced a bunch of really interesting um, social engineering type solutions, which are that the organization could mess with the server in such a way that people only received new emails at particular times of the day. Right? So you can't always be an email because, you know, I guess it's like your pause button, the individual, except it's a corporate pause button. So basically stuff gets shipped in at seven, right? So, you know, you, you don't, there's no point going looking for new emails because there are none until noon, and then the next lot arrive at four. So this is a very interesting idea. Will it ever be done? I don't know. I mean, it'd take a courageous company, especially if you've got kind of customers, for whom you have to be reactive to do that kind of thing. So one of the interesting things I've heard today, which I'm fascinated by, is this whole notion of email etiquette. But this is social engineering. So will we do it? I don't know, right? If you have external clients who have different expectations, I don't know. The other point about this is there are two ways to actually analyze this, you know, in terms of outputs and costs. So there may be individual productivity gains by me not replying to little messages from other people, but at a corporate level, that might be totally, you made this point earlier, greasing the wheels for everybody else, right? So I might be, you know, the best, you know, I might be a star-ranked employee, but I'm no help to anybody else. And if everybody behaves in a selfish way, then, you know, that just those little, you know, the, the glue that makes an organization work. So we need, to, if we want to analyze the impact of this stuff, it's not just seeing whether individuals are stressed, it's kind of what's happening at the corporate level. Okay, so, so that was social engineering. You know, now we're talking about technology, which we just kind of heard of, right? So one of the frequent statements you get about email is, it's kind of taken over my life. So one of the things I'm very interested in now is this whole notion of uh, empowerment, and I guess that's what Rescue Time's about, and it's in part what Boomerang is about. So we've been doing experiments with two types of, uh, of awareness tools. The first type I kind of like, Rescue Time, which really basically hold up a mirror and say, this is how you're spending your time, right? And the idea is, I guess, you, you know, so I'm interested in this behavioral change literature, so, you know, the first thing before you change the behavior, trans-theoretical model, is you have to be aware before you, and this is what Rescue Time's about, right? It kind of says, did you know this is how you're spending your day? And it doesn't, it's not, it's not programmatic, it doesn't say, and you should do, well, I guess you can make it be that way, but in general, that's the model. So that's one thing we've been looking at. And the second thing we've been looking at is kind of much longer, term patterns which are, you know, over weeks or months. And we have an application where you can kind of blog to yourself and then it plays stuff back to you and you kind of reflect on that. And I'll show you examples of how that works. 
Okay, so in our kind of micro studies, and these would back up the whole rescue time experience, we kind of do studies where we get people into our lab, we ask them to do stuff, and then my favorite question afterwards is, you know, can you just, we encourage them to multitask and be naturalistic. My favorite question is, kind of, can you put numbers on how you spent your time? And you won't be surprised at all. They're just awful at it, right? The, whether or not you ask it is like, you know, I spent a lot of time like at scale five versus I spent 43% of my, they're really bad at it. What I, what I found kind of counterintuitive and surprising was I expected the people who are really good at being focused to be better at this, right? So I expected the people who kind of were self-aware enough to kind of pick up when they were going off task to be those people who would give me better numbers. They didn't, right? So that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, so the more focused people weren't, uh, weren't more accurate. The other thing, and I was talking again about this in the session, is people are just so different, right, in terms of what they want the software to do. And you will have had this experience, right? So some people, you know, so we do debriefings that use the software. It's kind of produce a, an individual profile for them. This is how you spend your time. We get, you know, so we ask questions like, you know, and you all gone through this. Do you want it to be a pop-up, right? You know, if you spend more than 10 minutes in this app, should it pop up? Some people say, yes, absolutely, that's what I want. I want it to mess with my attention, right? Other people say, well, you know, do you want it to float? They say, totally, I want it to be floating there the whole time. Other people say, well, that, that's no good. I don't want it to, I don't want to see it. I just want it to take over and stop me in Facebook, right? And these are different people, and sometimes we do things where we ask the same person these questions twice, and they are inconsistent. So I just don't think that people have very good insights either at the, you know, at the use of time level or about at the meta level, which is strategically how about this. So I guess we're into the wonderful world of software defaults where we kind of say, well, it should be the user's choice, right? A bit of a problem, right? We, we know this. People who work in end user applications is, you know, a bunch of engineers, we all get together. Could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be, oh, edge case, whatever, right? And then we just say, well, let's make it a default, and then we get a crappy system, right? So we have to kind of punt for something. Could you, could you talk oh, microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so that's individual differences. And then a really interesting other point which came up in the productivity section uh, session was we don't just want to know about, you, you know, numerically how people are spending their time, we want to tie it to outcomes, right? And this is like the toughest problem in the world, right? So you could, I could be in Facebook for, you know, eight minutes and that can be totally destructive in my work. I could be in Facebook for 20 minutes, but if I'm super productive, no problem, right? So what we, and you know, anybody who's been a consultant or worked in this context, you know, you don't know how to get a handle on productivity. You really don't. Just so I think the, the, the question of having this be in an app and be measurable, maybe can provide norms, people suggested norms that were associated with roles or whatever, that seems like a really interesting way to go. But you're never kind of going to be able to ground it out for an individual. One of the things that we're experimenting with is like emotional metrics. So the system, the macro system I'll, I'll describe in a minute, you have, we, we have people kind of say, this is how I'm feeling at this point. So that's kind of a subjective measure, and maybe it's like Chip sent me high's flow experience. So you maybe kind of know when you're doing well, and you can correlate that with kind of rescue time type metrics, right? You know, maybe that's best than nothing, but we're not going to ground it out in, in, in truth. Okay, so, like, oh, I don't know. Just. So if, if people are interested in the, in the PR demo, that's, that's over here, right? I just want to describe what it does. So basically, it's a, it's a personal microblog. So I kind of write, so it's in the spirit of quantified self, but I write myself tiny messages in the day, and I also give them an emotional rating, right? And then what the system does on a kind of quasi-random basis is it plays this stuff back to you, right? And then it says, why didn't you reflect on that? Okay, so here's somebody, right? So here's somebody, yeah. Here's somebody talking about studying, right? But it could be work or whatever. I should be studying, but I'm watching Grey's Anatomy on a legal website, which is not a good thing, right? So that's kind of an evaluation. She knows she's got a work habits problem. Okay, system presents this back to her a week later, 
right? Unprompted. It says, reflect on this, please, right? Yeah, because I'm trying to be good about only watching TV once I finish certain assignments. I hope and keep it up. Maybe I can use it as a reward or incentive for finishing that assignment. Ha ha. Right? So she knows she's not doing too well at this. I'll have to see if that works or not, seeing as how it hasn't run really in the past. Right? So what the system's doing to you is it's reminding you about these implicit goals that you have. And we see these types of behaviors about food, about exercise, about personal relationships. So they're all kind of themes that come up. Now notice there's no clever software, so it's not like we have quantified self relationship o meter, right? They're just microblogging, right? They're microblogging about stuff they're interested in and that's important to them, but we just won't let it go away, right? So this is like, you, you know, your, the bathroom scales, they follow you around the house and kind of, you know, bitch at you a bit, you know, hey fatty, you know, hey, you know, you're, Right? But these are things you've said about yourself, so it's okay, but those just come back to you. Uh, I'll take it. I'll just... Okay, I, I don't want to... I guess I, we have a version of... Actually, we have a version of automatic quick scan that formats documents, or this, this is about reading technology. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up. So, information overload, not a new problem. Right? But a, a very pernicious new variant of it because we're all hyper-connected and there's more stuff which is directed at us. Right? So the problem is not that there are bigger libraries in the world. The problem is that people are asking me to maybe do something. Action information drains attention and effort. Right? So it takes us away from things that we should be doing and it kind of creates a zombie-like problem that we can spend all day in email if we want to. It's a distraction and a time sink. And then the last thing is, you know, I don't know what the solution is, but I think these technologies that actually give us insight and maybe allow us to kind of empower ourselves by seeing what our habits are, I think that's a way forward. Okay, thank you very much. But no, no. Uh, I was wondering if the software gives any information about um about how you're feeling or kind of like what the root cause is for. Like she knows she's not supposed to be watching the internet or something. Why? So, 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 sorry, I didn't show you the emotion ratings, and we're now we're now experimenting with uh, automatic emotion detection of uh, skin connectivity. But she can see. I can I, I can plot. We do emotion graphs be over time. So this is again in the spirit of quantified self. Um, so you, you know we can get this. This is kind of global data. So she can kind of see what the good days in the week are, and this is complete cliche, right? That her Saturday is his Saturday, his Sunday, she's happier. But we can show other graphs, right? And what she has to do is she has to create an account of how it is that she's spent, and we can do these on an activity basis, how she's spending her time and how that relates to how she feels. So you mentioned in your first slide, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, how the uh, you know the the tendency for us to archive these huge amounts of data is is not not at all like um, it's not physical. Concern. It's not like physical hoarding. Yes. Um, do you? Uh, what about people that they will let the inbox pile up? I mean, it's not archived. Uh, you know, I've got the thousand or multi thousand uh, emails that I just can't let go of. Are there any psychological similarities there? I mean, so I'm not sure what you. I mean, is that a personality? Is your question? Is there a personality type that I can predict keeps that stuff, or is that a problem? A little, a little of both. Yeah. So, so I think I think there's some evidence that that shows that that's the case, right? That there are. So, so we do. It's it's, but it's a weak correlation. So I can show the big five personality types, one personality type, neurotics are more likely to keep that information. Right. But I guess you had some other aspect of the question. Oh no, that was, that was, that was pretty much it. Right, but, but it, I don't see keeping a lot of messages in the inbox as a massive problem. I, I, I just think, you know, I found three, in 1996 there were three types of people and I couldn't see uh, some as being any worse than others. Those are frequent filers, they have small inboxes, um, spring cleaners, they periodically clean up, obviously enough, and then there are no fires. 
And other research, which I haven't had time to talk about, shows it's pointless to file, right? Well, there's a small point in filing. If you file, a lot of people who file stuff don't use the files to retrieve, right? And even when they do find, use the files to retrieve, they're no better than if they use search. <coughs> So I don't ever move a, uh, an email, um, but I have probably four or five hundred rules yeah. to, that put mail into folders so that I can, you know, think do a business thing and not think about personal or do some personal things yeah, and yeah. not think about business because it does it automatically for me beforehand. Well, where does that fall on your... Well, I guess, so, so uh, I, I mean, I guess I'm interested in regular people. Um, so you, you're not, because you're a programmer and you're cool with that. I mean, all you'll know is that you just want to be aware of, of uh, false, uh, false negatives, which where you create a rule where an important thing gets missed. And I did a bunch of, you know, so I think Priority Inbox is, is progress. But an interesting Google, I don't know whether the Google guy is still here, an interesting insider story when I talked to them is they were amazingly resistant to doing that. You know, the developers of Gmail were very resistant to that because they were concerned about the case of where, you know, which was mentioned already, something that's important that where the rule misses it, right? The other case isn't so important where something that's unimportant is, is prioritized. But that's a strategy, but you've got to be able to program. And you're going to have time to program and you know when we talk to managers, they they don't have either of those skills. Right? Thank you so much, Steve.